So we're going to look at creating subordinate clauses. Uh, and obviously, there's uh, it's, it's a pretty big topic. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do them. Um, this is not the only kind of subordinate clause uh, that you can use, and it's not the only way to make it. But we're going to talk about it as um, what we'll talk about as the overlap method. It's one of the ways that you can result with a subordinate clause. And so let's look at how to do it. Okay, you can create a subordinate clause by combining two sentences, or actually three or four, as we'll see later. Okay, the sentences just have to have a couple of requirements. Uh, first of all, the sentences should share a noun phrase in common, so they should have the same noun phrase in both sentences, and then one of those noun phrases has to be the subject of the sentence. Uh, the second noun phrase could be uh, in a place other than the subject of the sentence. But in order for the combination to work, one of the noun phrases has to be in the subject spot of the sentence, which means it has to be the thing doing the verb. Um, okay, so for example, Mr. Brightish used to coach baseball, and Mr. Brightish was Mr. Kavanaugh's freshman math teacher. Okay, so these sentences are, uh, they meet these requirements. They share a common noun phrase. Mr. Brightish is in both of them. And one of the, actually both of them, is the subject of the sentence. Mr. Brightish is the subject of the sentence in both cases. So it's okay if both of them are subjects. It's just that one of them has to have subjects. So uh, check, check, and then these two sentences are candidates for combining uh, by using a subordinate clause. Okay. So this is the process that you combine the sentences with, with which you combine the sentences. Okay, uh, and you want to write these down in your notebook. It's going to seem kind of like an awkward uh, process, but luckily there's an exact process where if you follow these steps, uh, you'll always end up with a sentence that uses subordinate clauses. Okay, so first, you write out the first sentence, until you get to the end of the common noun phrase. So you just start writing one of the sentences and you stop after you finish writing the common noun phrase. So write out the first sentence until you get to the end of the common noun phrase and then you stop. Step two, you replace the second sentence's common noun phrase with a relative pronoun. So you're going to take the word that, which, who, whom, or whose, and you're going to put that in the spot of the second sentence's common noun phrase. Then you write the rest of the sentence exactly how it is all the way to the end of the sentence. And then finally, you go back to where you left off with the first sentence, and you finish it. So remember, uh, step one had you stop after you got to the common noun phrase. Then you continue in step three, writing the first sentence. Okay, so those are the steps. You write out the first sentence until you get to the end of the common noun phrase. You replace the second sentence's common noun phrase with a relative pronoun. So that, which, who, whom, and whose. And we'll talk in a second about how to select which relative pronoun you're going to use. And then you write the rest of the second sentence until the end. So the only change you made to the second sentence was that you replaced the overlapped uh, phrase with one of these words, and then you write out the rest of the sentence, and then you go back to where you left off with the first sentence, and you finish it. Okay. Uh, then at the very end, you check to see if you need commas. We'll get to that. So let's go back to our two sentences. Mr. Brightish used, used to coach baseball. Mr. Brightish was Mr. Kavanaugh's freshman math teacher. So I take the first sentence and I write it out until I get to the end. So, so this is the overlapped uh, noun phrase, right? So I take the first sentence and I write it until I get to the end of the common noun phrase. So I'm going to write Mr. Brightish. Then I'm going to stop. I'm going to go to the second sentence and I'm going to replace the common noun phrase with a relative pronoun. In this case, I'm going to use who. Who was Mr. Kavanaugh's freshman math teacher? Okay. I went all the way to the end of the sentence. So this part right here, who is Mr. Kavanaugh's freshman math teacher, is the exact same sentence that I had up here. It's just got, instead of Mr. Brightish, 
the relative pronoun. Then I go back and I finish what I hadn't finished from the first sentence. So I stopped after Mr. Brightish and I keep going used to coach baseball. Okay. So Mr. Brightish, who is Mr. Kavanaugh's freshman math teacher, used to coach baseball. And the final thing that I need to do is check for commas. Okay. So this is almost right, except the commas might not be right. Does that make sense? Look, if I I still have the exact same first sentence there. Mr. Kavanaugh used to coach base or Mr. Brightish used to coach baseball. There's no like change to that sentence. It just got interrupted with this sentence. And this clause, it's it's a subordinate clause right now, um, is almost the same thing as the second sentence was, except I use a relative pronoun who um, in the spot of Mr. Brightish. Okay. So let's let's figure out how do we need uh, if we need a comma or not. Okay. Essentially, if the clause is not needed to identify the noun phrase, you need commas around it. You will also use which or who as the relative pronoun, and we call this a non-essential clause. Okay. And what I mean is that the clause is not needed to identify the noun phrase. If we go back to Mr. Brightish. Uh, if I drop this subordinate clause, who is Mr. Kavanaugh's freshman math teacher, you wouldn't say which Mr. Breidich used to coach baseball. So in this case, we would say that it's a non-essential uh, subordinate clause. Okay. However, if removing the clause would cause you to say which, whatever, which Mr. Breidich is the writer talking about, then it's called an essential clause, and you don't need you don't use commas, okay? Um, you also use the word that instead of which as the relative pronoun, okay? So um, it's really a question of like, is it needed to identify the noun? Let's look at some examples, okay? If I say the house burned down and the house is on the corner, if I combine those to say the house that is on the corner burned down, this is an example of an uh, essential clause. If I dropped that is on the corner, you would say which house burned down. Okay, notice I haven't identified which house burned down except through the subordinate clause. Okay, so if I say the house burned down, you would say which house? Oh, the house that is on the corner burned down. Do you see how that, that is on the corner? is necessary to identify the house that I'm talking about. So this is what we call an essential clause. That's why we use that, because it's an essential clause. And we don't put commas around the subordinate clause here. However, if I say my house, which is on the corner, burned down, I have ex almost exactly the same sentence. But notice now if I take out this clause and I say my house burned down, you don't say which house. This is extra information about where my house was. So the two sentences here were, my house burned down and my house is on the corner. So if I said my house, which is on the corner, burned down, this is called a non-essential clause because it's not necessary to identify the noun phrase. That's why I used which instead of that, and that's why I put commas around it. Yeah. There's a possibility that it could have been an essential clause if I say, my house that is on the corner burned down. If you're confident that this is correct grammatically, then what I mean is if I say my house burned down, you would say which house? Oh, my house that's on the corner burned down. So imagine a paragraph that said, my house that is on the corner burned down, but luckily my house which was at the end of the road is still standing. So now that I have two houses, and that's what, what I'm implying, you need to know which house burned down um, because otherwise it's unclear. So in that case, that is on the corner would be an essential clause, even though my house seems to say that you don't need it to be. Do you see what's tricky here? This is only correct if I have multiple houses, and that in order to identify the noun phrase, you need to know this information that I'm talking about the one on the corner. Okay? So, another example. My best friend called. You wouldn't say which best friend. Uh, my best friend, who, my, who I roomed with in college, called. Okay, so this is an example of an essential, a non-essential clause. That's why I'm using commas. 
because if I take this out, you don't say which best friend. But if I said, my friend that I roomed with in college called, I'm using that in this case because it's an, it's an essential clause. If I said, my friend called, somebody would say, well, which friend? If I said, my friend who I roomed with in college called with commas, I'm kind of implying that I only have one friend. And of, as you know, that's not true. So um, this is the difference between uh, a non-essential clause, and that's why I'm using commas and who, an essential clause. That's why I'm not using commas and which. Okay, so let's go back to this uh, sentence about Mr. Brightish. This is the correct way. Mr. Brightish, who is Mr. Kavanaugh's freshman math teacher, used to coach baseball. Because if I take this clause out, you don't say which Mr. Brightish. So uh, this is an example of a sentence that's a subordinate clause, and it needs a comma on either side of the clause. And it also needs the word who instead of the word that. Okay, so let's try doing that again, because this is the kind of thing that you need to practice a couple times before it makes sense. Um, let's take a sentence, Mr. Holman likes to weight lift, and Mr. Holman was my sub today. So in this sentence, we have the requirements for a subordinate clause sentence. We have an overlapping subject. Mr. Holman is in both subjects, both sentences, and at least one of the subjects is in, or uh, at least one of the noun phrases uh, is in the subject spot. In fact, both of them is. So the step that we would do is we would start with the first sentence, Mr. Holman. We stop. We take the second Mr. Holman and we replace it with the word who. Who was my sub today? And then we continue with the end of the first sentence, likes to weightlift. Okay, so we say Mr. Holman, who is my sub today, likes to weightlift. And then the reason why I put the commas here is because if I said Mr. Holman likes to weightlift, you wouldn't say which Mr. Holman. The fact that he was your sub today is only a part of like the information about him. It might be important to the sentence, but it's not essential for identifying the subject. Um, so that's why it's uh, in commas. Okay. Notice you can also go backwards. So in this case, we took this sentence and we subordinated it into this sentence. But you could take this sentence and subordinate into this one by saying Mr. Holman, stopping, who likes to weightlift, and then going to the third, the end of the sentence, was my sub today. So notice, Mr. Holman, who likes to weightlift, was my sub today, um, carries kind of the same information as Mr. Holman, who is my sub today, likes to weightlift. But notice uh, there's difference of importance, and that's, in, that's an important part of a subordinate clause, is that the, the, the clause that's subordinated, the sentence that gets put into the other sentence, is going to be thought of as le less important. So in this sentence, your most important piece of information is that he likes to weightlift. You're giving extra information that he was the sub. And in this sentence, the most important information is that he was your sub, and you're just giving an extra fact about him. So both of these would be fine, but it has to, uh, it's determined by what you want to do as a writer. Okay. Remember, only one of the common phrases has to be the subject. So let's look at this sentence. I can't wait to bring my in-laws to Summerfest and... Summerfest is a 10-day music festival in Milwaukee. Just like before, we have an overlapping noun phrase. Summerfest is in this sentence, and it's in this sentence. Okay? But unlike before, uh, only one of the sentences has it as the subject. Okay? Um, the other is this object of the preposition, which is whatever. It's just not the subject in this sentence. Okay? So it still meets the requirements for a subordinate clause creation, uh, but this has to be the first sentence now. So step one, I can't wait to bring my in-laws to Summerfest. Stop. Now I got to the end of the sentence actually, but the only reason why I stopped is because I got to the first sub common um, noun phrase. Then I go to the second sentence, I replace the common noun phrase with which, which is a 10-day music festival in Milwaukee. Okay, so it says, I can't wait to bring my in-laws to Summerfest, which is a 10-day music festival in Milwaukee. And then the rules say go back and finish the first sentence, but there's nothing to finish of the first sentence. I had gotten to the end of it already. Okay, but even though this subordinate clause is at the end of the sentence, it's still the same process. Now, you can't go in the other direction. You can't say Summerfest which 
I can't wait to bring my in-laws too. I mean, you could kind of like mess it around a little bit. Um, but um, you need to have that subordinate clause uh, come from the one with the subject as the common phrase. So with, with this one, we could go in either direction because they're both in the subject sentence. Uh, but in this one, we can't really go in either direction because you have to have the uh, subordinate clause be made from the sentence that has it as its subject. Whew, I think I got a little confusing there. Okay, let's go to the next uh, um, way to do this. You can hang more than one subordinate clause on a sentence. So in, in what we call by the sentence is the, the independent clause can have multiple subordinate clauses coming from it. So let's look at a sentence like that. Kobe Bryant played his whole career with the Lakers. Kobe Bryant was the youngest player to reach 3,000 points. Okay, so in this way, you can see this overlap is going to let me do a subordinate clause. But I could also have a sentence, the Lakers are the NBA team in Los Angeles. So now I've got an overlap of the Lakers with both of these sentences. And I've got an overlap of Kobe Bryant with both of these sentences. Okay, so I'm just going to do the steps. Kobe Bryant, stop, who was the youngest player to reach 3,000 points, stop, and then go back and finish the first sentence. Played his whole career with the Lakers. But now I can stop, who are the NBA team in Los Angeles, stop, and then go back to the first sentence, okay? So Kobe Bryant, who was the youngest player to reach 3,000 points, played his whole career with the Lakers, which is the NBA team in Los Angeles. Both of these subordinate clauses are stuck into the part of the sentence where their overlap occurred. So my main clause, Kobe Bryant played his whole career with the Lakers, is exactly there as it was Kobe Bryant played his whole career with the Lakers. So that's my independent clause. It's been interrupted. But it's got, um, it's still there. And then my two subordinate clauses, which are marked by these relative pronouns, who was the youngest player to reach 3,000 points, and which is the NBA team in Los Angeles, are just coming off of that independent clause. Okay, I know that's really kind of tricky sounding, but if you think of them as just separate things, I could have just said Kobe Bryant, who was the youngest player to reach 3,000 points, played his whole career with the Lakers. Or I could have said Kobe Bryant played his whole career with the Lakers, which is the NBA team in Los Angeles. So you can kind of like treat those as separate processes of a subordinate clause. Okay, so I think uh, if you look that over again and, and you really listen to kind of how I'm, I'm putting that together, that should make sense to you. Okay. So let's try some out on your own. Um, well, let's make the second sentence into a subordinate clause of the first sentence. Okay. Uh, Cephalot's ants have a flat head. Here they are. Okay, so that's my first sentence. And my second sentence is the flat head is used to block the door to their colony. Okay, so um, I want you to try to do this real quick. Uh, and you can pause the video or the, the proctor can pause the video and, and kind of uh, wait until you have some time. But what you want to do is you want to make this second sentence a subordinate clause off of the first sentence. Okay, so go through the steps and see if you can do it. I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, so the way that you should have done it is you should have said that the overlap is the flat head. That's in both of these sentences. It really doesn't matter that the article is different. It can say a flat head and the flat head. That has to do more with the part of the sentence that it's found. So like in general, like that's okay. So what does the rule say? You start with the first sentence. Cephalites, ants have a flat head. You stop, you take the second sentence, and you take that common noun phrase, which in this case is the flathead, and you replace it with which, which is used to block the door to their colony, and then you stop. And then you go and finish the first sentence, which is already finished. Okay, so it'll say just like this. Cephalin's ants have a flathead, which is used to block the door to their colony. Now, in this case, you could probably say uh, cephalid ants have a flathead that is used to block the door to their colony. Because it's unclear if you would say, like, uh, which flathead blocks it or whatever. This is really true. Like, these ants, this is the way they look. Uh, this is their head. 
And what they do is they use, um, there's a beetle that makes holes in wood. Uh, so the beetle hole is, is pretty big. And the ants um, normally wouldn't like a hole that's that open to other things getting in. So if we look at this picture, you can see here's the ant. And here's an ant that's serving as the door. So this ant is going to sit here and kind of block the, this is just the top of its head. But it uses the top of its head to fill the hole that the beetle had made. So the, the ant colony is inside this, or it's, it's temporarily using the inside of this uh, tree. And because of the way their heads are shaped, they're perfectly sized to stop anything else from getting into that hole. So this poor ant, he's on door duty, and his job is to sit there um, until it needs to open, and then he just moves his head. It's really kind of a cool uh, kind of co-evolution of, of with a beetle and a, okay and a, a subordinate clauses again so we got this let's try this one more time Romeo and Juliet was written by William Shakespeare Romeo and Juliet is a play set in Italy and William Shakespeare died in 1616 okay so this is going to allow us to subordinate two clauses into this main clause so I want you to take this independent clause Romeo and Juliet was written by William Shakespeare and I want you to hang these two subordinate clauses, or make them into subordinate clauses, and then hang them off the first sentence to create this complex sentence that has two independent or one independent clause and two subordinate clauses in it. Again, you can either pause it, or the proctor can pause it for a second, and see if you can write out what would be the resulting sentence, in this case, using subordinate clauses. Okay, and the answer is Romeo and Juliet, which is a play set in Italy, was written by William Shakespeare, who died in 1616. Because just like that Kobe Bryant thing, we have Romeo and Juliet overlaps here, and William Shakespeare overlaps there. So you say Romeo and Juliet, you stop. You say which, because you're replacing this common pronoun with which, uh, your common noun with which is a play set in Italy. You're going back to finishing the first sentence, was written by William Shakespeare. Then you're stopping because you got to the end of your other uh, overlapping noun phrase. And you say, who died in 1616? And then you go back to finish the sentence, but in this case, it's, it's already finished. Okay, so this is the way to do that sentence. Um, you could have also said Romeo and Juliet, which was written by William Shakespeare who died in 1616 is a place set in Italy. But that's really tricky because you've got a subordinate clause inside a subordinate clause. Don't try that at home. Okay, so um, in general, uh, I think it's pretty clear. There's a lot of uh, things that can seem complicated about it. But really, I would just focus on does it meet the requirements for a subordinate clause construction this way? And remember, it has to have an overlapping common noun phrase, and it also has to have one of the common nouns. And we don't mean common noun like a not proper noun. In this case, we just mean shared noun or whatever. Uh, one of these shared nouns has to be in the subject spot. And uh, then once you figure out that the requirements are right, then just run those three steps, or four if you count for uh, checking for commas. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Uh, um, you know, your homework tonight will kind of uh, give you some practice with this, but that's the uh, one of the ways to use subordinate clauses and one of the ways to, to construct subordinate clauses.